Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 22. Start your first Bitcoin business this afternoon with our guest, Roger Veer. Please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com. Enjoy the show. We're here in sunny Mexico at Anarchapoco 2016. With me today is Roger Veer. Roger, thanks for coming on. Great to be with you. Roger, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became an entrepreneur. Uh, so I was born and raised in Silicon Valley, and I guess uh, it started at a young age. I noticed in junior high school is, I guess, when it really started. Uh, the teachers were selling candy bars to raise money for some school club or something or other. And it was just normal, regular candy bars that uh, you can tell how much inflation has taken place since then, but they were 50 cents each. Um, and I knew that you could buy them at Costco for between 20 and 25 cents each. So I asked my parents to take me to Costco and I had, I don't know, you know, 20 bucks or something that I had saved from searching through the couch cushions for change and maybe a buck or two there from allowance. Anyhow, I bought a bunch of candy bars and started bringing them with me to school each day and selling them to the other students for 50 cents each. And I think that was maybe the, the start of it. Yeah. You know, I'm finding out that from all these interviews, that's a very common, it's actually the most common way that people, kids started getting entrepreneurial experience is they went to school and they wanted to sell candy. It's not taught, but they did it in between classes. And that's one of the best experiences that children are getting. Talk to me about memory dealers, uh, when you started that, why you started it, and why you started accepting Bitcoin. So um, I started memory dealers while I was still in college, and I guess I was fortunate to be living in Silicon Valley, and this was during the dot-com bubble bust, and all these companies were going bankrupt, and you could buy up their computer hardware on for pennies on the dollar. And uh, initially, I just wanted a bigger hard drive for myself, for my own computer. So I saw in the newspaper that there was an auction for one of these companies that was going out of business, and I thought, oh, maybe I can get a cheap hard drive there. And I, I went there and I remember very clearly it was a nine gigabyte SCSI hard drive, which at the time was pretty big, right? Huge at the time. Now it's laughably small. This was probably 99. And I remember they were selling them for uh, $100 each and they had a bunch of them there. And uh, all the money I had in, to my name at that point was like $1,400. And so I bought 14 of these hard drives for $100 each, $1,400. And you could turn around and sell them on eBay for $350 each at the time. And this was when eBay was brand new. So I you know, basically tri oh, more than tripled my money in the course of maybe 10 days. And then I realized, oh, that I, I like this a lot better than what I had been doing previously. And, and there were tons more computer parts that you could buy locally and then sell on eBay for a heck of a lot more money. And and uh, I decided that memory was easier to ship than hard drives or whole computers because it's really small and lightweight and, and worth a lot of money. So uh, I started selling memory and memory dealers was born. Yeah. And you are a very early adopter of Bitcoin. Talk to me about how you started accepting Bitcoin at memory dealers and why you started doing that and what led you up to believe that, hey, this is this is money of the future. I want I want to be ahead of the curve here. So my hobby in, in junior high and high school had been studying economics. And through that, I realized what the characteristics what the characteristics of good money are. And when I read and heard about Bitcoin, I realized it was the best form of money the world has ever seen. And and actually, unfortunately, memory dealers, pretty much all of our customers are, are corporate companies and big companies for the most part, which aren't even today really using Bitcoin to pay bills yet. But uh, philosophically, I was as on board with Bitcoin as I possibly could could be. And so I became the first company of any sort of size or substance to start accepting Bitcoin back in uh, 2011. And uh, we've been accepting it ever since. And to be honest, uh, at Memory Dealers directly, there's only been a few customers that have paid in Bitcoin. But later on, we launched BitcoinStore.com, which sold millions of dollars worth of stuff for, for Bitcoin. And uh, it's been a fun ride the, the whole way through. So you were learning about money in middle school. Is that is that right? Yeah, it was kind of more through dumb luck. I think it was probably the summer between eighth grade and freshman year in high school, but it might have been between seventh and eighth grade. And I was bored in the summertime, probably because I wasn't allowed to get a job because of the government, you know, age restrictions on, on getting jobs. And uh, I was looking on the bookshelf at, at my home for something to read because I guess I was bored with video games or whatever. And I came across a book called Socialism by Ludwig von Mises. And I had no idea who von Mises was at that point. And, uh, 
and I didn't really even know what socialism was, but I knew that Americans were kind of supposed to be against socialism and in favor of capitalism, but I figured I should at least have, I should at least hear the other side of the story and, and hear what the socialists have to think. So I picked up this book by Ludwig von Mises, and I, I'm sure lots of the listeners of this podcast know exactly who he is, and but I picked it up thinking that it was a pro-socialism book. <laughs> and, and after reading the book, I learned about... I started to learn about economics, and I learned in, in that particular book, I learned how important prices are and how prices transmit the information about what what resources should be used to produce what goods. And without prices transmitting this information, people would be lost, and they'd have no idea if, those, if the road should be paved with gold or asphalt or, or what. And the prices coordinate these people all over the entire world to work together in harmony to produce the most amount of things for the most amount of people in the most efficient manner. And without a pricing system... That would all just completely fall apart. And so socialism is impossible to work. It cannot work. It's not that it's just good or bad in theory. It's that it cannot work. Without the prices, you can't calculate what goods should be produced with what other goods. And uh, wow, what a what a path did that send me down on? Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what the intentions of socialism is. I mean, at its very economic basis, it, it cannot work, period, because they don't they don't recognize the importance of the pricing mechanism in the marketplace. Uh, would you say that you found freedom through economics? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I started out being your kind of general, you know, America, yeah, yeah, moderate conservative type and thought presidents were good and governments controlling the economy was fine and militaries are just fine. And and the more economics I started, the, the more I realized everything government does prevents the world from being as wealthy as it otherwise would have been. And then much, much more recently, uh, I found some other authors, uh, Larkin Rose in particular, kind of pointed out some of these other ideas that an individual can't delegate a right that they don't have, and a group of people can't delegate a right that they don't have. And so if you can't delegate a right that you don't have, and groups can't delegate rights that they don't have, where does government get its authority to do things? And I think the answer is that they have no legitimate authority, But and the economics didn't really teach me that. And so now I see it from this whole other angle. Like Economically, it's just absolutely insane to have governments doing these things. And then philosophically, it's insane as well to have these people bossing everyone around. So. But, but what if 51% of the people agree, Roger? It doesn't make it right. So talk to me about the early days of Bitcoin and why you're so excited about Bitcoin and how you see this providing more freedom in people's lives. So I was already a, a libertarian because of studying economics, and I saw Bitcoin as this tool that strips away every single government on the entire planet's ability to control the money supply and allows people anywhere in the world to interact financially without having to ask for permission from a bank or a government or anyone else at all, for that matter. And uh, what could be more exciting than that to someone who realizes the power of free markets to make the world a better place? Yeah, I mean, what gives these people up in ivory towers the right to start printing this money and distributing it out however they want and assigning whatever value they think that, that it deserves? You know, what can we do economically speaking or just philosophically speaking or just human speaking to help people understand the significance of a free and open money? I think just start using Bitcoin in your daily life and realize like anytime you voluntarily trade something else with someone else, you're both better off. If you sell something to someone, it's because you value the money that they're giving you more than what you're giving them. And they value whatever you're selling them more than the money. Both of you are better off after the trade. And Bitcoin now enables everybody all over the planet to trade with each other, despite the politicians. Yeah. So let's let's give a short example of this. Let's say you have a Bitcoin and I have an Apple. And it doesn't really matter what the price of the Bitcoin is. If we trade, I give you the Apple for the Bitcoin. I think the Bitcoin is worth more than the Apple. Otherwise, I wouldn't trade with you. And you think my Apple is worth more than your Bitcoin. Otherwise, why would you trade with me? So it's a win-win scenario. This isn't really understood by a lot of people. Um, granted, we're all taken into public school and we're not taught the essence and the beauty of, of the mutual beneficial aspect of the marketplace. But just objectively, I can tell that this, this Bitcoin is worth more to me. So I'm gaining value and this Apple's worth more to you. You're gaining value. It's a, it's a very beautiful way to see the marketplace and, and interaction. Let's go to entrepreneurship a bit. What you, You're a serial entrepreneur. You've invested in a ton of companies, a ton of successful companies. What are you looking at right now to invest in, or what, what are you most excited about entrepreneurially? I think I just made that word up, entrepreneur. To be honest, I, I don't really think I am a serial entrepreneur. So I, I had one business, Memory Dealers, and I stuck with that for like 15 or 16 years until I saw Bitcoin and then I dropped everything and focused on Bitcoin full time. And here we are five years later, and I've been focused on nothing but Bitcoin. And uh, I see myself being involved in that for, you know, as far as I can see into the future at this point. So 
you are an entrepreneur. What lessons have you learned? What life lessons or how has it created more freedom in your own life being an entrepreneur and having control of that, that time and those resources? Yeah, I, I think that's one of the best things. Like if anybody out there is listening and thinking about starting their own business, my advice is do it and do it today. Don't be afraid. You know, you have nothing you have nothing to lose. Your your whole life can be so much better. And I choose what time I'm gonna wake up in the morning. I choose what I'm gonna work. And for the most part, I love what I'm doing. So I, I woke up this morning at four forty five AM because I promised some other people I would talk to them about Bitcoin that were in, in Amsterdam. And then I had more calls after that. But it, it it's fun. I'm excited to do it every single day. Um, and that's the, the nice part about being an entrepreneur is you're excited about what you're doing. It doesn't feel like work. It feels like an exciting, exciting time. Yeah, we're here at Anarchapoco and a lot of the speakers are talking about passion and how important that is for entrepreneurs. If you're not passionate about what you're doing, then you should you should stop and then you should reevaluate what you're passionate about and keep doing that. I mean, nobody can deny your passion about Bitcoin specifically. And it's really interesting because your passion in Bitcoin doesn't just come because you think the price is going to go up or you think that it can help a couple people. You see this as a revolutionary way to extend freedom to anyone that wants to, to voluntarily come into this Bitcoin community. Download a wallet. You were just here with, with a couple where they you help them download their first Bitcoin wallet and they're going to be able to send Bitcoin, fractions of Bitcoin dust or whatever, anything back and forth easily for free with, with no third-party approval. Um, what are you most excited about right now in the Bitcoin space? I'm, I'm really excited because I think Bitcoin is it's, it's kind of like a snowball and all the libertarians have been pushing this snowball up the hill. But we're getting close to the crest of the hill and it's going to start rolling downhill to where all the non-libertarians and all the non, you know, all the people that don't even care about monetary policy or any of that. Yeah. Where they're just going to be like, wow, I can save 25% on my next iPad by paying in Bitcoin using purse.io. Like all these people are going to get involved. And when that happens, it's like the snowballs rolling downhill and it's just going to gather more and more momentum. And uh, it's going to roll over all these fiat currencies all over the world. And Bitcoin is going to become a predominant currency used across the world. I can really genuinely see that being possible and see that happening in the not too distant future. Yeah, speaking of purse.io, I've used it. It's great. Uh, save 10, 20, even 30% on Amazon. Even whenever we were chatting uh, just a little bit ago, you had uh, you were giving a speech up in front of everyone and you came up with an entrepreneurial idea just on the spot, it seemed, where people could come to purse.io, purchase something for 20 or 30% off, have it shipped and delivered, turn right around and sell it for five or 10% off on, on eBay or Amazon, I mean, not Amazon, but like on eBay or Craigslist, all of a sudden they've got their own little business. This is, you know, you've given people an idea like, Hey, use this one service that you can get a lot off, make a spread on it, start your own business and start controlling you know, your own assets. I mean, how, how easy is this? It's, it's pretty easy. I mean, you only need maybe, you know, $200 to get started. I, you need whatever the price is of the first item you're going to buy on, on eBay. Yeah, it's basically what you did at Memory Dealers many years ago. And actually what I've started doing with Memory Dealers now is we've been using purse.io and buying a whole bunch of Cisco uh, IP telephones. And we've been buying them at like 29% off and then selling them at other deal to other dealers for maybe 10% off. And it's gone really, really well and it's easy to do and anybody can do it. Yeah, anybody out there, even... People in high school, I don't like to call them kids, but you know, even even high schoolers or, or people young in their teens, they could they could do this and start their own business. What a better way to use their time rather than to be stuck in high school for you know ten hours a day or to go to college and rack up two hundred thousand dollars in debt. Whereas they can start their own little business, maybe hire a virtual assistant, which was what I spoke on uh, yesterday, and start building their own business. How has being an entrepreneur, Roger, created more personal freedom in your life, or how has you being an entrepreneur and building business or investing in the business that you've invested in created more freedom for your clients? Any voluntary economic exchange makes both people better off. So with memory dealers, I had you know customers all over the world. I had a, a real nice email from one customer in Australia, and he said, Roger, I, I was doing some math and calculating everything up, and we saved over a million dollars by buying the parts from you rather than buying the parts from the, the regular distributor that they were using. And that's a lot of money, right? And now they have that million dollars that they can use to either hire other engineers or other employees or invest in something or do R&D on something else. And the world's a better place because of that now. There's an extra million dollars of capital that can be uh, used for to, to make the world a better place. And and that's what entrepreneurship is, is, is moving assets from where they're worth less to where they're worth more. And that's creating new wealth in the world. There's not a fixed amount of wealth in the world. It's not a zero-sum game. The pie of wealth is getting bigger and bigger. And entrepreneurs are the ones that are helping that pie grow bigger and bigger for every human on the planet. That's exactly right. Roger, is there any 
additional advice that you'd like to give to young entrepreneurs? I know you already said just go out there and do it. And that's what Jeff Burke was saying as well yesterday is, you know, don't don't sit around and wish you could do this. You know, just go out there and try something and fail, you know, 10 times if you have to. And eventually you're going to keep learning these lessons and you're going to figure something out that you're passionate about and you can do. Is there any other advice that you'd like to give uh, young entrepreneurs from your own experience? So a lot of times with entrepreneurship, when you're starting your own business yourself, you're the one that's doing the sales and you have to be the salesman. Realize that when you're calling a company or meeting someone and asking them to buy something, like don't be shy, don't be afraid. The absolute worst thing that can happen when you call up a company and ask them to buy your product is that they say no. But that's the exact same result as if you don't call them at all. So nothing bad can happen if you call and ask. So don't be afraid, don't be shy, call them and ask and, and, and tell them what you have to offer and what, what value you can offer them. And the worst thing that can happen is that they say no. And only, basically only good things can, can happen. That's, that's the point. Only good things can happen. Roger Veer, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I look forward to continuing this conversation later. And uh, yeah, enjoy Anarchapopo. Thank you, Ash. Thanks again for listening to episode 22, How to Start Your Bitcoin Business This Afternoon with Roger Veer. Don't forget to rate us on iTunes, subscribe to our YouTube and Facebook pages, and come back next week for another episode of Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast.